I want to welcome Agile XRM to the podcast. I've known the people at Agile XRM for the past 12 years. I've seen how their business process management tool can add massive value to complex organizational processes in sectors such as finance and government. If you have complex processes or a need for dialogues on the Power Platform or Dynamics 365, take a look at how this BPM tool can add value. You can find them at agilexrm.com or check out the show notes for more details. Welcome to the MVP show. My intention is that you listen to the stories of these MVP guests and are inspired to become an MVP and bring value to the world through your skills. If you have not checked it out already, I do a YouTube series called How to Become an MVP. The link is in the show notes. With that, let's get on with the show. Today's guest is all the way from Ontario, Canada. He works as an associate director and power platform practice lead. He's in his currently in his fifth year, going on six as an MVP. He's the author of a book called Agile Office 365. You can find him on Twitter at H Kotoru. Welcome to the show, Hanil Kotoru. Thank you. Did nice I pronounce everything you. right? You did. Wow. Very good. Very good. Yes. Not, not too Most bad. People usually bad. just completely batter up my first name, my last name, at which point it's like, just call me whatever. <laughs> call me, call me, hey, or yo, or, or <laughs> whatever you want. I love it. I love it. So tell me, what's your story? What's my story? Mm. Uh, what's my my MVP story? What's my... no? What's your what's your what's a you know? Where did you come from? How did how? What do you tell us a bit about things that are not related to MVP, not related to tech? But tell me about you know your your work, your fun, your play, your family, those type of things. Hmm, that's a big one. Uh, very diverse, but I would say career-wise, I would have never thought I would be ending up as an MVP or as somebody who's working in, in the Microsoft space. Uh, when I was in university, originally, I really wanted to go into uh, um, engineering or architecture. And then later on, I was kind of hoping to go to medical field. Um, and then while I was doing my undergrad, I said, you know what? Medicine may not be it. Engineering is great, but why don't we just combine the two? Uh, and I was actually looking at a field called biomedical engineering. Um, and so I spent my first nine years of my career, I actually did a master's in uh, computer-assisted surgery. And then I spent nine years working in the field, uh, published four patents, uh, specifically in the orthopedic space. Um, and yeah, that was really exciting. And when I talk to people, even today, I left the field in 2007. And even when I talk about it today with people, um, they get very, very uh, uh, interested, very excited because I was literally doing augmented reality before the term was invented. Because augmented reality is something that's, I probably would say, less than 10 years old. Right. There was virtual reality, but then the idea behind taking, you know, live imagery and then superimposing something, there really really wasn't a term for it. So so developing software where imagine you're taking a, a CT scan of a body and you're kind of creating a 3D model and you're able to navigate and, and virtually put an instrument into the body. So you're actually putting it in, but you don't have to cut the whole body open. You make a small keyhole incision and it shows you where you're on. You're doing submillimeter accuracy when it comes to to uh, measurements like that's that was quite groundbreaking at the time wow so that's that's where i came from yeah. that's cr that's crazy that's crazy and, and i just a couple of things that kind of pricked my interest there uh the patent side of things what's the process around getting a patent uh so i was working in a research facility so it was actually quite straightforward as long as the client is willing to sign that uh that they're, you know, uh, uh, participating in a research study, uh, obviously under supervision of doctors. Um, that really is all that, that it took to get uh, live patients. Um, for some of the research, we needed to work with cadavers. Uh, it was a bit easier. They didn't really have to sign much. Um, there was, uh, you know, um, certain individuals where they would sign ahead, of, you know, before their death that would say that, they're willing to donate their body for research. So. so so what about, you talked about, was it three patents you got? 
as part of that Four. process? Yes. Four patents. So is that a very involved process? Uh, getting a patent is quite involved. Uh, there's typically first, there's a, a legal element where you'd have some legal lawyers search to find if there's anything similar that has been done. Uh, and then you basically have to write the patents and it has to be written in a way that can be easily copied. And if there is something similar, then you have to write it in a way that it will be still considered unique and not obvious. Mm -hmm. Wow. And and was it a long drawn out process or is it like, is it a three month thing, a six month, 12 month, multi-year? Probably six to 12 month, six to 12 month typically for a patent, yes. And sometimes just the, the legal uh, searches can take months sometimes. Wow. Well, crazy. So, so that that's the industry you used to be in. Tell me how you how you crossed the bridge. How did you come into into the Microsoft side of things and get into you know software things like that um, from what you were doing? Yeah. So, so it was a bit of a, a change in. Um, so the company I was working for. Technology was very expensive at the time. I was working on silicon graphic machines, if if the, the audience or if you if you remember those. Yep, yep. Um, so a system would typically go for close to a million dollars, and so hospitals don't have that kind of budget to spend. Um, and uh, orthopedic companies often what they would say is they'd say, okay, we'll buy this, we'll buy this computer for the hospital, as long as the hospital's committing to using so many implants for uh, you know at a minimum for their surgeries, right? So um, uh, orthopedic implants are, are very expensive. Um, and and so every company tries to get their their uh, their foothold into, into a hospital, right? Because they typically within an hour, it's like several thousand dollars of just hardware that's being spent. So for them to throw in, you know, a million dollars, sometimes it's not a huge deal. If you imagine how many of those surgeries they can do, maybe six or seven a day, you know, you multiply that by the number of you know days and how many surgeons you have working in parallel. Um, then the cost has come down significantly from SGIs. They went down to using PCs running on Linux, so the cost became you know a few thousands as a period post a million. Um, but there were some changes, and then there were some some company reorgs and everything. And, and essentially, the division I was working for was sold to a company in in Germany, and so. And literally, there was about 150 of us that were left out of a job overnight. Um, so my choice was either to relocate to either the U.S. or Europe or Israel, which is where I'm from, or um, or to to basically shift my career. And I was just freshly married in Toronto, so picking up and leaving was not a first option. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So tell us tell us a bit about your family. Uh, so I'm married. I got three daughters. Um, got 13 year old twins, another 11 year old. Wow. Um, so they're yeah, they're they're a handful. My younger one, my 11 year old, she's very much interested in in technology and robotics and everything. So she's taken after me. Um, she actually co-presented with me at a conference one time. That's so on cool. Her ninth, on her ninth birthday, yes, that was quite exciting. Um, yeah. And then, you know, my, my twins are very diverse. They, they love different things. Um, so. That's so cool. That's so cool. That's so cool. So tell us how did, you know, bring us up to speed. You, you're obviously in the power platform space now with Microsoft. I take it your yes. MVP is in that area. Tell us, tell us a bit about that journey. How did you get to where you are now? How did you, you end up, you know, five years ago getting your MVP? What was that journey for you? So I've always liked giving back to the community and, and presenting and, and the, the whole social element of it. Um, and I've been working with a number of people at the time and uh, I was doing some blogging and I was doing some presenting, not a lot of it. And it was actually a colleague of mine who at the time said, hey, you know, you're, you're putting out some good materials. Why don't you get your MVP? And I always thought, you know, MVP is kind of, it's like for demigods, right? It's not, it's not for me. I'm not, you know, I'm not that, that caliber and I never thought of it, of it. And, uh, and basically he said, no, just keep it up. And he introduced me to my, my, uh, the CSM, which is the community, uh, manager, uh, for, uh, for Microsoft for the region, um, had a couple of calls with the individual and he basically says, you know, here's an Excel, fill it out with all of your contributions. And he says, I, I want to see a few more by the end of the year. And before I knew it, I, I got my MVP. Wow. It was, it, it, it was yeah. 
Have you always been an MVP in Canada? Yes. Because yeah. it, this is my experience, right? Is that when I used to go, when, when we had in-person MVP summits, the Canadians were just next level amazing with how they showed up. You know, you're in your red and white. You had awesome jackets, awesome merch. And it was kind of like the Canadians were seen as the pinnacle of their CSM was just like the best and like the the merch and stuff. Did, were you in, in it when that kind of stuff was happening? Did you make it to some MVP summits? Yes, I went to, I think, three MVP summits before COVID hit. Uh, so, yeah, so if you actually look at some of those pictures and you'll see kind of front center, I'm I'm there. So, yeah, the, the energy is just amazing. I crashed one of the Canadian photos. There was a big photos on the staircase in one of the food locations, um, uh, you know, as an after party type event on Microsoft campus. And, um, yeah, I just... I, I had something similar to what everybody was wearing, so I was just got in there, and so there's a random Kiwi in the uh, in the Canadian group photo at, uh, at at one point. So, so what area of technology do you mainly work with? You know, Power Platform is kind of a very broad um, collection of technologies. What what have you really honed your skill on? What what area do you excel in? Do you tend to um, be most focused on? So of the Power Platform, I spend most of my time in Power Automate and Power Apps. Um, less so with Dataverse and uh, Power Virtual Agent. And I would say even within that space, I'm focusing very heavily on recently on governance. What I'm finding is there's a lot of organizations who are rolling out Power Platform. And it's basically say, let's turn on the switch. And we're going to have a whole bunch of citizen developers. Let them have fun. Let them let them uh, uh, innovate. Let them simplify and streamline their business process without any thought put behind it. What they don't realize is that you know I always you know give that example of Spider Man right with a lot of power with great power comes great responsibility. But it literally is like that. What what sometimes IT fails to realize is that you are equipping your citizen developers with tools to achieve a lot in a very short amount of time. You can delete an entire SharePoint environment in a very short amount of time, right? You can cause some serious damage if you don't know what you're doing. Um, You can create data loss if you're not putting the right guardrails in place. There's a lot of things that can go wrong if they're not properly governed. And so I did a survey online on LinkedIn um, about two months ago, just to find out, you know, who in your organization is actually managing the Power Platform. And so I think it was about uh, 50% or so said that it was IT. Um, there was maybe around 20 or so percent that said uh, that it was business. A small percentage said that there was a dedicated team. And what was surprising is that 30% of companies there's nobody who's governing the Power Platform. It's a free-for-all. And so this is where I, th- I, I just found that the, it's, it's um, I don't want to say it's a niche area. I mean, if you were to compare it to other things, like, yeah, it's not as sexy, it's not as exciting as actually building solution, but there's a need. There's, there's a definite need to, to, to uh, you know, help these organizations uh, close that gap. Yeah, so true. Are you are you using RPA as part of that story? RPA is also part of that story. Absolutely, you're referring to the Power Automate desktop solutions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. What, are you seeing um, any particular um, examples? Do you have any particular examples where you're seeing RPA in production use? Um, well, I mean, I'm seeing it when it's tip. So I personally see RPA as a stopgap. If there is a published interface available then use it. It's faster. It's more predictable. You can usually get better better throughput. You don't have the overhead of setting up another machine or another VM, other accounts, right? And so either when you're working with a, del- a legacy uh, environment or if there's certain functionality that is lacking, I find that that's typically when companies are going to use uh, RPA solutions. Um, but once once there is a more favorable solution available through, through uh, direct access, then that's how companies would typically like to go. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. 
So when you, when you think of all the projects that you've been involved in over the years in the Microsoft space, kind of are there any three that really stand out and why? Oh, wow. That's a, that's a really uh, loaded question. Um, I mean, one particular one that we, we literally took a, uh, a religious institution from the Stone Age to a, a very serious digital transformation. It was really looking at everything that to do, which is it used to be all on paper. There was almost no computers being used at all to everything that they were, almost everything that they were doing was now being done online, which includes also if somebody wants to become a minister, the whole pathway to all of their studies and their certifications and their reviews and their, like everything has, was all being done through the part platform and SharePoint and, and other automation tools. So it was kind of great to see how even in those kind of areas, technology still has a good fit. Mm -hmm. When you when you look at um, are there any others that pop to mind? Um, other ones. I mean, not right now. Maybe if they come back later, I'll uh, we'll yeah go back to that. Is there um, in in the when you look at the type of organizations you have worked with, what's the typical um, profile, if you like, of organizations that come to you to use your service? Are they you know, do they have a massive challenge? Do they are they wanting to innovate? Are they uh, are they like fully like a paper based like the one you mentioned, or access heavy, or Excel heavy, or you know, or is a NAP modernization program? What are the reasons they're coming to you? So I would say one category when we work with financial organizations, they are inherently very um, Excel based and very manual process based. So they come to us to say, okay. We need to do better. We need. We have a lot of people where all they do is just copying and pasting data between Excel's. It's time consuming. It's error prone. It's not the best way. So that's one. I would say one category where we're actually working with CFOs and and financial and and uh, accounting departments or finance departments, organizations to to digitize and optimize their business processes. Um, another category that we have are companies who are using the Microsoft stack today. Um, they're interested in getting into automation. They're not doing it yet. So they're, they're more uh, cautious, I would say. So for them, they would say, let's build a governance first before we start building any solutions because we want to make sure that we're doing it right. And so for them, they would start with a go you know, establishing the governance and establishing the rules of how things are going to be shared, who can build, how they build, how do you approve something, and all of that. So then we have these uh, cowboy companies who just love to, you know, they need to see a new tool, nice and shiny. They just roll it out and, and hope everything's going to go well, right? Um, and then after a while, they realize something goes wrong or uh, uh, somebody's having an issue. And then want to start put the, the brakes on. And they call us and say, oh, you know, something's happening. We don't know. Maybe you can help us assess the situation and, you know, usually we'll do an assessment. They say, we don't think it's being used very much. And then they're sometimes shocked to find out just how much um, the the proliferation of the Power Platform has has taken roots in their company, right? Because pe because it is easy, right? It's easy to build a solution. It's easy to automate. And then if they want to, they really want to, want to uh, uh, put the brakes on and take a step back, they realize, okay, that's a problem now because now organizations, uh, departments have become dependent. And so if you want to say, stop using it, now what do they do? They can't really, they can't just say, okay, stop, you know, roll back. So that becomes sometimes a bit trickier. You have to almost like do, do a, a microsurgery to, to pinpoint exactly the source of these problems and, and then fix them. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Well, this has been really interesting talking to you and, and seeing your experience. Just to wrap up, tell us what impact um, achieving MVP has had on your career. Um, definitely it helps in terms of uh, exposure. So it's in terms of clients, for example, when they hear that you're an MVP, they are sometimes more inclined to listen to your opinion, um, especially if it's a uh, tiebreaker, right? If one person says one thing and you say something else, they're not exactly sure. Having that MVP 
gives you the advantage. Some, not always, right? Uh, you know, uh, but it does come sometimes give you an advantage as somebody who has more in-depth knowledge, um, who's better connected with the Microsoft team, right? So while as an MVP, I cannot tell you certain information that Microsoft tells me, I can guide you in a certain directions, right? So as a client, for example, as, as recent as two years ago, I could guide clients who said, okay, we want to do this, you know, this big custom solution on Skype. It's like, maybe you look at Teams instead, right? Without calling it out until it was actually announced, we couldn't really just tell a client Skype is dead, right? So that's just one simple example. But there's other solutions. You know, you mentioned RPA before. So uh, when uh, um, the the uh, the solution was actually purchased by, uh, uh, you know, Win Automation uh, and integrated into the Power Platform, again, it was something that I've known about. And when clients would say about, uh, you know, what is Microsoft's answer to RPA? I would say, well, you know, I'm sure they're working on something. Stay tuned. Um, you know, don't hedge your bets on the competitors because there may be something there because it is the it is part of a full solution of a part, you know, for all the major solutions. So having something for RPA is definitely there. Um, so again, without going into the details, that is something that I find is very valuable um, as well as just building a great network of people. Like for me personally, is I love to travel. And so I actually took my wife to, just before COVID, I took her to Portugal for our, for her 40th birthday and actually met up with an MVP and she took us around and showed us certain parts that normal tourists would never see because it's not something that's in the tourist books per se. So for me, the social aspect is a, is a really important part. It's not about the, it's not all about the, the contribution. It's not all about the business. A lot of it is also personal. Hanil, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Hey, thanks for listening. I'm your host, business application MVP, Mark Smith, otherwise known as the NZ365 guy. If you like the show and want to be a supporter, check out buymeacoffee.com forward slash NZ365 guy. Thanks again and see you next time.